This is Selma Schimmel at the ESMO Congress in Milan, Italy. And up until this point, we've been talking with many key opinion leaders and researchers about some of the exciting data and new compounds that are becoming available to cancer patients. But now we're going to shift the discussion and really learn more about how is a compound developed and what happens within a company that is working on a drug that hopefully is going to bring great benefit to, in this case, lung cancer patients. And to help us understand the drug development process, we're joined by Dr. Jamie Skillings. Uh, Dr. Skillings, you are the Senior uh, Director of Oncology at Pfizer. Yes, that's right. And thanks for spending some time, because yesterday we were joined by one of the physicians presenting data on behalf of lung cancer, uh, crizotinib. And today we want to talk to you a little bit about how the drugs developed and the strategy that goes into building uh, an oncology line and so much encouraging news coming out on behalf of lung cancer patients. Yes, it's, you know, it's, uh, developing a drug is more complex and takes longer than most people realize, starting with the research group who uh, find the right compound and test the drug for activity before it ever gets to patients. And uh, then we have to begin work in patients to identify the right dose and the safety of the compound and its attributes in, in people before we start to evaluate the safety. What's really interesting about crizotinib is that we were uh, already testing the drug in the phase one trial when the Japanese published data about uh, EML4-ALK as a driver of lung cancer. And so we were able to fast track the process. And we're expecting that crizotinib may be one of the most rapidly developed oncology drugs ever. You know, I don't know if the public really understands how much risk goes into and, and cost that the company, a pharmaceutical company or a biotechnology company, has to really absorb all that risk and how costly the process is. And also, you go through so many hopeful attempts at many different compounds until you finally find one that's going to stick. Yes, yes. Well, thousands of molecules are tested before they ever get to patients. So we start off with a very large funnel, and then gradually, at each step in the development process, uh, the drugs get narrowed down until we have that perfect combination of effectiveness and safety. Uh, and so that's why um, uh, it takes quite a while as a rule. The longest step, and the, actually the most expensive step, is testing in patients. So let me ask you, based on what you're saying now, testing in patients, which sort of points to some of the issues that we have to deal with in getting patients into clinical trials, uh, and that's sometimes a challenge because we're still trying to demystify that experience, but we depend on that relationship between doctors and, and patients, researchers, to be able to successfully prove whether a drug is going to be effective. Some of the challenges that you face, what, what can we do to encourage patients to actively participate in trials? And based on the fact now that you're looking at something so exciting, fast tracking, a, a, a drug for a quicker approval, the role of patient advocacy in all of this? It, patient advocacy is very important uh, to share information and also to share the message of the importance of clinical trials. Um, the easiest way for a patient to obtain access to crizotinib right now is uh, by enrolling in a clinical trial and speaking to their oncologist about being tested first and uh, or being sent to a clinical trial center to be tested and potentially enrolled in a trial. Um, this drug has been interesting and there have been other high profile drugs over the years but this has been the most exciting I think in terms of media coverage and then uh, networking that patients have done through blogs and uh, direct um, sharing of their experience. We have a lot of patients referring themselves uh, or, or asking their doctors to be referred because they've heard of this program through word of mouth. Talk to me a little bit about 
where you are today in this approval process and sort of what does the timeline look like and next steps? Mm -hmm. Well, we're um, actively engaged in a number of clinical trials. We have a randomized trial, which is about one quarter enrolled, um, comparing crizotinib to chemotherapy. And we have a, a large phase two trial uh, where we have over 100 patients enrolled. Um, we have another randomized trial um, in first line, patients who haven't had chemotherapy before for lung cancer. And that's also comparing crizotinib to two chemotherapy drugs, a doublet of chemotherapy. And we are doing some other preliminary trials with other targeted agents to uh, see um, whether that could be uh, also of value for the future. Uh, we plan to submit data to the FDA next year uh, for accelerated approval of the drug, and this will be data from our phase one trial as well as our phase two trial. So I believe you said, did you say a quarter of the way enrolled right now? For the phase three trial, yes. Which means there, you, you're still recruiting patients into the trial. Yes, it's, it's a global study and we're enrolling patients all over the world. We just recently opened sites in China and we're uh, actively enrolling everywhere. Uh, we're at a European meeting. Uh, European investigators are very important to the study. So for the viewer who is perhaps already on some treatment for non-small cell lung cancer, who has not yet been tested, wondering, is it too late? can I still be tested and what happens to that person who is already on treatment? What are the guidelines, the criteria to be enrolled in the trial? And if you haven't yet been tested and are already on treatment, is it too late to get tested? It's not too late to get tested. Um, the patients who have the least chance of having an ALK fusion event are ones who are already known to have an EGFR mutation or a KRAS mutation. Those are two other uh, mutation events that are seen in lung cancer. But other than that, we have a trial in patients who've had one prior chemotherapy. We have a trial in patients who've had no prior chemotherapy. We're enrolling patients who've had multiple prior chemotherapies. And if uh, people uh, don't qualify for any of the trials, uh, Pfizer will find another way of providing drug if they test positive for ALK. And the test, if I recall, is done on tissue? Yes, it is. It's done on a, a few slides from a biopsy from the patient's tumor. So someone who is well past their surgery, those tissue specimens and slides are still available, and so testing can happen after the fact. Yes, yes. Uh, um, as a rule, pathology specimens are saved indefinitely. So uh, we go back to the saved specimens from the original surgery, original biopsy. From time to time, um, the tissue isn't adequate, there isn't enough tissue, and patients have, have to have another biopsy uh, from, a, from another site, such as a metastatic site. How costly is it to test? We don't really know how costly it will be uh, when a commercial, uh, approved commercial drug is available. Uh, there are some commercial vendors who are doing testing, and quite frankly, I don't know what the cost of the test is. But for the trial uh, purposes, is, is it cost prohibitive or can a patient has to go to their physician and the physician would have to order the testing, but for the patient who's listening now wondering, can I afford to do this, how does that process work? So all of the costs of the testing are borne by Pfizer for the clinical trial. There is no cost to the patient. All right, so the goal here is to encourage more enrollment and to maybe foster a discussion between patients and their doctors. I know sometimes it can be very intimidating for patients to talk to their doctors about clinical trials and if with the majority of patients being treated in the private sector and maybe not being at a cancer center, what advice do you have to viewers that aren't at a cancer center and want to engage in a discussion with their doctor about a participation in a trial? There's a lot of information available online. Uh, there's clinicaltrials.gov, which has information available for patients. So I think there are ways for patients to get information uh, about clinical trials. And uh, I do believe uh, if, if a patient speaks to their doctor 
to say, um, is it possible that I might have an ALK fusion or ALK positive lung cancer, that that would be evaluated. Dr. Skillings, is it a challenge for companies and for the academic centers to get the information, especially something as, as exciting as ALK, out to the vast number of, of medical oncologists in the country that aren't at academic centers to help sort of facilitate this trials process? You know, normally it would be, but uh, Krizotnib has had such remarkable activity that we've actually um, talked to doctors who are working at a community level in uh, medical oncology, and almost all of them have heard of Krizotnib. So uh, I think it really depends on the level of activity and excitement about the drug. This drug is, has been very exciting to cancer specialists. They don't um, very often see a drug that works the majority of the time. And that in itself is wonderful for patients and doctors to have that conversation. And lung cancer being truly a disease that requires a multidisciplinary oncology team. You've got mm -hmm. the surgeon, the pulmonologist, you've got the medical oncologist. I would imagine the goal is the patient going into surgery wants to have this discussion so at the time when the pathology is taken, that's the ideal time to then get the, the testing done. I think that's exactly where we're heading. Um, I, you know, our trials are for patients. Uh, most, of, most of them have recurred from surgery or have disease that's already been treated. And it is possible to test even in that setting. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be very valuable for patients to know their ALK status earlier on. And we are thinking about strategies to prevent recurrence of lung cancer. And we are planning a, an even broader development program in the future. Well, it's very exciting. And I'm so glad we got to sort of balance out the other discussion that we've had about the drug itself and get a little bit more information about what goes on behind the scenes in drug development. So we have been watching at ASCO what's been happening, now at ESMO, and I guess next year we'll be revisiting to see how the approval process is going. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamie Skillings, Senior Director of Oncology Advisor. Thank you.